Welcome back to Math 118. Uh, today we start our study of Chapter 2, which sort of formally introduces the idea of functions. Um, then we're going to do a little bit of work with them um, and sort of look at how they uh, behave, how they combine, and all of that. But of course, before we can do any of that, we need a notion of sort of what a function is. Um, and, and sort of all through nature, right, we see situations where, where we can measure or model the change of one variable in terms of another, right? If, um, you know, you're going to mail a package, right, the, the cost of the package often depends on the weight, right? If you were to stand in one location for a while, uh, then the temperature would depend on the date and time. If you're flying to space, right, um, your weight uh, is a function or, or depends on the altitude, right? If you're finding the area of a circle, that depends on the radius, right? Um, and we're looking to uh, sort of formalize this notion, right, and, and, and use it for our own studies, right? We sort of want to build a machine um, that, that models this in a sort of general sense. So we're seeking this sort of machine, right, this, this black box where you feed in an input and it spits out some output, right? And, you know, what, what is going on inside of this machine could be a total mystery, right? Um, or it could have some sort of like fixed rule, right, where you take the input and you, you know, do some fixed rule to it and an output, right? So you input a color and it spits out the complementary color, right? You input the color red and it outputs the complementary color green, um, you know, or it could have, um, you know, numbers as inputs and you square the number on the output. Um, one thing that we totally allow to be valid for this, right? Um, if, if we're calling this machine our function, which I should spell correctly, um, is that like if you put in something that it's not used to handling, it's totally allowed to break, right? If we have this color transformation function, um, then if I try to feed in, say, the number five to it, it's going to break, right? Um, the, the other thing that's important, right, is it should only spit out one output per input, right? If our input is red, it shouldn't output a green and purple, right? That would not make any sense because, you know, one input, one output, right? Um, so if you think of the set of all inputs as a set and uh, the possible outputs as a set, that allows us to um, formalize what we've been talking about, right? We can actually write the definition of a function. So we'll start with our definition. So a function from a set A from a set A to another set B is a rule that assigns to each element x in A, right? So, so, so for every element in x, exactly one um, element of B, um, which we call f of x. Right, and, and this is what, what we were talking about, right? We, we take it from our, our set A, this is our input space, and we get an element of set B, right? Um, and as we said before, right, you have exactly, it's not a highlighter, you have exactly one element of B, right? We can sort of think of um, another way to, to get this idea of a picture, right? Say we have some set A, and subset B, right? These two um, amoebas, right? And we have some numbers in them, right? You know, maybe the number one is here, the number four is there, the number five is there, the number 13 is there, and then over in set B, 
you know, maybe we have 10 is right there, 20 is right there, and 30 is right there, right? And then we, you know, we, we have our function f, right? Or our, our um, relation f, right? That can kind of map like this, you know, so we would say that f of five equals 10, right? Because when we take five and use f to transform it into the b space, we get 10. Or, you know, we say 13 might map to 20, so f of 13 equals 20. Let's say 1 maps to 30, and 4 also maps to 30, right? Um, there's nothing in, in our definition, right, that says that um, two elements can't map to the same element only that one element can only map to one other element, right? If, if that sort of makes sense, um, you, you can have situations like this, but what you can't have are, you know, maybe a situation like this, right? If we squeeze another one right down here, right? You have some other set A, I guess we'll call this A prime, some other set B prime, Right, where maybe uh, A has the elements one, two, and three right there, and B has the elements, you know, maybe 10, 20, and 30. And then, you know, we can have some, some other function, which say it takes one to 10, it takes two to 20, it takes three to 30, but it also takes two to 30, right? This is not allowed, right? Say this is G. It's G of two, G of two, and G of three, right? In, in, in this situation, G is not a function, right? Because we have um, G mapping two to two different places, and that breaks the exactly one part of our definition. Um, let's do a little bit more notation before we uh, start looking at some specific cases. Say we have some arbitrary function um, from a set A to a set B, right? So I'll draw my little set A like this and using our same matching colors like this, right? So this is our set B. This is our set A, and we have some function between them. Right, so this is our F. So we call A the domain, right? And I, I sort of mentioned domain sort of in passing when we were studying rational functions. Um, but now that we are um, exploring it a little bit more, we can do a little bit more here um, and then uh, as we sort of keep studying um, functions and their graphs and all of that, um, we will keep coming back to this idea of domain. So our domain in this case is the set A. Right? Um, so if, if we call, if, 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 if we recall um, during the lecture on rational expressions, right, I said that the domain is everywhere that the expression was defined. Right. And when we were talking about this thing, that's the function machine, right, the, the inputs, right, that, that's our set A. And so there are, our domain is the set A, right? It's everywhere, everywhere, or all of the values, right, everywhere the function. is defined. Right. If I were to say, you know, with this color transformation function, if I were to say, try to put five on the input, well, five's not a color, so it's going to break. And that's because five is not in the domain, right? It's a set of all of our valid inputs to F. Right. So, so um, it's, it's, it's worth noting here, right, that we're dealing with the entire set A, right? If, if any, um, elements of uh, A, 
fail on input, then our function doesn't work, right? Because our definition, right, um, says that it, it assigns every element, x and a, one element of b. So if any of our elements of a fail, well, then the thing we're dealing with is not a function. Um, often besides the idea of, of domain, you'll see this idea of range, right? And, and range you can sort of think of as the image of f, right? Um, it's everywhere that um, f sends elements of a. Right. Um, if 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 you want to think about this formally, right, the range of f, it's a set, right, and it's the set of all of my f of x's, where x is in a. And so we saw here that the domain must be my entire set a. Here's my question to you. Does the range have to be all of the set of B? And, and we'll sort of explore this um, a little bit more formally in um, a little bit. Uh, but I do want you to sort of kind of pause, ask yourself this question, right? Our, our definition of a function restricted our definition of a domain, right? It's, it's because our, our definition of a function says that it assigns each element X and A an element in B, that tells us that our domain, our set of valid inputs, has to be the whole set A. My question for you is, is that the same thing for the set um, B and the range? Does the range necessarily have to be all of B, um, or, you know, is, or, or, or does our definition of a function leave a little bit of wiggle room uh, for a change and, 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 and saying that the range does not have to be all of B. And then one last thing to sort of um, address before we uh, look at um, some more explicit examples of functions is um, this notation here, right? When, when people say uh, y equals f of x. And you know, we can sort of break this into three parts, right? Um, I'm going to actually er 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 erase that and, and sort of break it into three parts here. We're going to have x, f of x, and y. x we call the independent variable. Right, so, so we you know, can x, x can wander all throughout A, and we can always find some sort of output for it, right? Um, f of x uh, is the sort of um, object doing the transformation, right? So this is, um, I don't know, let, let's call it the, the transformer, right? Um, so f is the transformer, and for nuance, um, f of x is the transformed object. Right. So then what we can do, right, is, is say we take some variable y and we say that y equals f of x, right? Well, now y is our dependent variable, right? So, so by setting y equal to f of x, now we have two variables, what, right? One independent, our x here, and one dependent, our y. And not to get too ahead of ourselves, but if we actually use this, that allows us to, um, turn our functions into graphs, right? We'll explore that in the next part of this lecture. Um, but, but before we do that, let's work with just the algebra of, of functions first, right? Uh, so let's have an example, right? 
And let's say our function of x is x squared plus 1. Right, uh, this is a function. Uh, we need our sets a and b, right? So a is the real numbers, and b is the real numbers as well, right? This goes from the real numbers to the real numbers, and we can just put a little f to remind ourselves, right, that this is the function transforming between this set to that set. And what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate this at a few points, right? Let's say um, f of 1, f of negative 2, give us some more space, f of negative 2, say f of the square root of 5, and then we want to state its domain and range, right? Um, so if we're doing f of 1, what we do, right, how we evaluate this is you'll notice there's an x inside the parentheses here, and then there's an x in our expression. Well, now there's a 1 in our parentheses here. So everywhere that we saw an x before, we want to put a 1, right? So now this becomes 1 squared plus 1. 1 squared plus 1, last I checked, is 2. Because 1 squared is equal to 1. Okay, well now we're doing f of this, um, f, f of negative 2. So everywhere we see an x, we put a negative 2. So we have negative 2 squared plus 1. Well, negative 2 squared would be 4, and 4 plus 1 is 5. So when we input a negative 2 into our function, we get an output of 5. And now we'll do the square root of 5. So everywhere we see an x, we want to put the square root of 5. Square it and add 1. The square root of 5 squared is 5 plus 1 is 6. Okay, so what about our domain and range, right? So for our domain, um, think about what values in the real numbers, right? Because our, our input set right now is the real numbers. Um, this is sort of our candidate. Does anything in the real numbers fail when you put it into this? Well, the square of any number is defined, and adding one to any number gives you another number. So the domain is actually the whole real numbers, which is great. But what about the range, right? What is the range of our function? Well, we know, sort of off in the corner here, we know x squared is always greater than or equal to zero. Right, no matter what you put in, it's always going to become positive. So that would mean that x squared plus 1 is always greater than or equal to 1. So no matter what you put in, you always get an output greater than 1. Which means that's our range, right? Our, our range is the set 1 to infinity because no input will get us a lower number, right? This is still a function from the real numbers to the real numbers, but our range is a subset of that. So, go, so, so to sort of go back to this question from earlier, um, our range does not have to be all of the um, set that we're mapping into. It can absolutely be a subset. Okay, let's... Uh, Move on to, to an example that's a little bit trickier, just sort of one touch more difficult. So let's say, um, let's say f of x is 3x squared minus 4x minus 1. And we want to evaluate a couple of function values for this, right? Um, so let's find the following, f of a, f of negative a, and f of a plus h, right? So we can sort of just chug along with what we saw before and see if we run into any issues. Starting with f of a, well, we said before that when we have something in the parentheses, everywhere we see an x, we, we put that something there. So this would become 3a squared minus 4 times a 
minus 1. And indeed, that is f of a. There's, there's no simplification that we can do here. Okay, well, what about f of minus a? Well, that would mean that everywhere we see an a, or an, an, an x, rather, in, in this original statement, we should put a minus a. So if I go to my pen, we can go 3 times minus a squared minus 4 times minus a minus 1. Okay, so what does this equal? We have 3 minus a squared is positive a. So we have a squared. It's, it's positive a squared, sorry. Minus 4a times minus a is a plus 4a. Then we have minus 1. Okay, so what about the next one, right? What of f of a plus h? Well, everywhere we see an x in this original statement, we should put an a plus h. So this would be 3 times a plus h squared minus 4 times a plus h minus 1. Now we can start simplifying, right? Um, 3 times a plus h squared. a plus h squared is a perfect square. right? It's, it's the square of a binomial. So it's going to be the first thing squared plus 2 times the first thing times the second thing plus the second thing squared minus, I'm going to distribute my 4 in now, 4a plus 4h minus 1. Now I want to distribute this 3 into each of these terms. 3a squared plus 2ah, sorry, plus 6ah, plus 3h squared, minus 4a plus 4h, that should be minus, right, because when we're dis distributing in the minus 4, all minus 1. And this is, believe it or not, as simplified as it gets. But, but, what, but what we can use, right, let's sort of do one more part to this. I'm going to say using the previous results. Um, find this expression. Let's say f of a plus h minus f of a all over uh, h, right? Uh, we'll say where h does not equal 0, right? Because we, we do want to avoid, right, um, uh, any of these sort of nasty dividing by 0 situations. Well, this may seem daunting at first, but we know f of a plus h, and we know f of a, so we should be able to calculate this, right? Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy and paste this, right? So should that be negative? No, I grabbed onto the equal sign. So here's what we have, right? That's f of a plus h. Um, I'm going to sort of move that over there and shrink it just a little bit so that I can fit it on the line. Right, so that's f of a plus h, and it's going to be minus f of a, which is this guy right here. Copy, paste. Looks like we picked up a few little extra friends. Okay, so using the previous things, we have f of a plus h minus f of a, and we're going to divide that by h. Okay, so the next thing that we want to do is sort of um, see if we can do anything to cancel any of our terms in there. Well, so let's write this all out, you know, sort of distributing in this equal sign, right? Looks like we have 3a squared plus 6ah plus 3h squared minus 4a, minus 4h, minus 1, minus 3a squared, plus 4a, plus 1. All divided 
almost forgot that, all divided by h. So let's see if anything cancels. Right, it looks like we have a 3a squared here, and a minus 3a squared there. Looks like we have a minus 4a and a plus 4a, and it looks like we have a minus 1 and a plus 1. So that's simplified a little bit. Looks like we have 3h squared plus 6ah minus 4h divided by h. Okay, and now if we factor in an h out of each of these terms, looks like we have h times 3h plus 6a minus 4, but that's divided by h, so these two h's cancel, right, because h does not equal 0, and it looks like we're left with our final expression of 3h plus 6a minus 4. And now that may sort of seem like a, a you know, weird thing to do. Um, expressions like these actually arise all the time in calculus. Um, and so it's, it's useful for us to kind of get used to this sort of, the, these sorts of pieces of algebra. Um, because if, if, if you're comfortable with these, right, um, then those concepts will come even faster in calculus. Okay, so, so we've looked now um, at, at functions that are defined the same over their entire domain, right? No matter what you put in, you follow this one singular rule to get your output, okay? So what happens um, in situations where that's not the case? One of the common situations where, where we see something like this sort of modeled, quote, in, in nature, right, or rather in our daily lives, is cell phone plans, right? Um, uh, lot, lots of cell phone plans, you know, maybe they'll charge $50 for the first five gigs of data you use, um, and then, you know, $15 per gig after that. So uh, this is a thing where there's one input and one output, right? You have the um, gigabytes of, of data used for your input and the cost of your plan as an output. So can we describe that as a function? And it turns out, yes, you can, using a thing called the piecewise function. And we'll create one right here, right? Can we model this cost as a function of um, uh, gigabytes of data used, right? So, so let's build this function I'll, I'll call c of x, right, where x is the number of gigs used. And I'm going to say that it's equal, and then I'm going to put this brace right here, right? and that's going to tell us that it equals, you know, the thing that's over here. Okay, so if x is our number of gigs used, my base rate is $50. And that's true when I've used between 0 and 5 gigabytes of data, right? Um, you know, if I'm in this section, if, if, if x equals something in here, or if this is true, then this is my cost. But if my cost, if, if I use something more than 5 gigs, my cost changes, right? My cost is that initial $50 plus $15 for every gig I use after that, right? But how would I model the gigs I use after that? Well, the number of gigs I use after that is the number of gigs I've used total minus five. That would be x minus five. And it's equal to this when x is greater than five, right? Um, one thing to note here, right, is our domain, right? The, the domain of this function is all positive numbers, right? There, there's no way to make sense of using a negative amount of data. So our cost function breaks there, and so it's outside of our domain. Let's calculate a few sort of, you know, um, simple values out of this function. 
right? What's my cost if I only use two gigs of data, right? Um, that probably wouldn't happen, but let's say I, you know, spend uh, 28 out of 30 of these days um, in the woods where there's no service, so I can't use any data. I only use those two, right? Well, if that's the case, then I look to see where my input falls, and my input falls here, and so that means that my cost is 50. Okay. What if I'm really good and and, and I use Wi-Fi as much as possible, right? And, and I only use five gigs of, of data, um, you know, not on, on Wi-Fi. Well, if that's the case, then, you know, I sort of look to see where am I doing this? Well, if X is equal to five, then I'm actually still in this region. So that means my cost is just $50, right? Say I'm a little bit worse, right, and, and I use seven gigs of data. Well, that means that I need to follow this law here, right, because seven is greater than five. So that means that my cost is, say, 50 plus 15 times x, which is seven, minus five which is 50, seven minus five is two, two times 15 is 30. That means I have a total cost for the month of $80. And, and we can define functions sort of in pieces like this whenever we want, right? Th these piecewise functions don't have to model real world phenomena, right? Um, we can sort of just stick together arbitrary functions however we want, right? Um, let's say for, for instance, right, uh, let's define a function f, right? f is just sort of our, our, our default function name. And let's say, I don't know, let's, let's make it in three pieces, right? Um, let's say it's negative x uh, if we're between negative five and zero. Let's say it's positive x if we're greater than or equal to 0, but less than or equal to 2. And let's say we're x squared minus 3 if we're greater than 2, right? We can totally define it in, in three pieces, 10 pieces. You could define a, a, a piecewise function as the sum of, you know, say, 500 pieces, right? Nothing stopping you, although maybe it would be hard to write all that down. You'd need a pretty big sheet of paper. But anyway, here is our, you know, function defined in three pieces. So let's calculate some values, right? Let's take, um, I don't know, for example, let's say f of negative 2. Well, the first thing we do is we look at our input and we see that it's negative 2, and we need to decide which of these that it falls on. Negative two would be on this one. So that means we would need to, you know, go negative and then wherever I see an X, I want to put this there. So it would be negative, negative two or positive two. Okay, what about F of zero? Right, well, um, zero is on the boundary between these two, but this one is strictly less than, and this one is less than or equal to, so that means we want to use this one, but we're just outputting whatever x is, and in this case, x is zero. Okay, what about I don't know, three? Well, three is greater than two, so that means we're using this one. So that means our function will spit out three squared, minus three, or in this case, six. One more piece of um, piecewise functions. What about this thing that we looked at earlier, the absolute value of x, right? Can we model this as a piecewise function? Well, as we sort of said when we were looking at it, the absolute value of x is defined differently if you're positive or negative, right? So, if we're positive, well then it just spits out x. 
if we're negative, it spits up the magnitude of x. Well, what's the magnitude of x? Well, it would be the positive version of that negative number. Well, the positive version of that negative number is just negative x, right? So, so this thing that, again, we use a lot, this absolute value, is actually just a piecewise function, right? That, that, that's why these things are so useful. And before we, we sort of wrap up this introduction to functions and kind of move on to this next section of the lecture, which we'll talk about building graphs out of them, I wanna take another slightly closer look at this concept of domain. We're gonna spend a lot of the rest of this quarter looking at um, how various types of functions and their graphs work, right? Sort of analyzing them. And, and the domain determines where that function is defined, right? If we're dealing with an input outside of our domain, the function breaks. And we want to avoid broken functions, right? There's no way to study something that's broken in this way, right? Um, that's what engineers are for. I kid, of course, um, I was almost an engineer uh, before I decided to keep doing math. Um, but we should take a closer look at uh, the domain so we can you know, give the engineers more constructive problems to work on um, instead of you know, trying to fix our math errors. Um, so uh, let's take a look at um, this thing, right? this object right here in more detail. Right. Um, let's just say, you know, look at this this one piece, right? This uh, piece of uh, of our piecewise function. Let's say f of x is x squared minus three. Right. The domain of this function is the real numbers, right? But we actually did something slightly more than that. We said that it's subject to the restriction, right, that x is strictly greater than 2. And what we mean by that restriction is we're restricting the domain, right? So our, our new domain, right, subject to this um, sort of orange restriction, I, I hope my, my, you know, color choice makes that obvious, my, my new domain, this set of valid inputs, is two to infinity with the soft bracket here, right? Because this is uh, greater than, not greater than, or equal to, right? So this this restricts our our domain sort of by default, right? Um, but there are some functions that, uh, without having to add a a domain restriction, even if we're used to working with functions that work on all real numbers, right? These um, functions just by their structure restrict the domain automatically, right? So let's take a look at some of those, right? And we're going to sort of form two columns, our function, and we'll do this in red, its domain, right? Uh, let's start with something like this, right? G of x is 1 over four plus x, right? This, this appears to be a function over all real numbers because we haven't given it any sort of restriction. But does this structure of a function just give us automatically any sort of restriction? Well, what can we put into this function and what can't we, we put into this function? Well, possible areas where our domain breaks, possibly one of the biggest that we will work with this quarter is dividing by zero. Right, it doesn't matter what what math you're in. You're not allowed to divide by zero. So, what would make this zero? Well, that would mean that four plus x equals zero. So, x would have to be negative four. But notice, if you put in anything other than negative four, our expression is totally valid. This function is completely defined. So that means that our domain is everything the set of all x where x does not equal negative 4, right? We're, you know, maybe for, for being totally complete, we should add that, that x is a real number here. Um, but all of the functions we're dealing with in this class are going to be 
um, you know, sort of on the real numbers, right? Uh, especially ones that look like this with variables and all that. So that's understood, right? So our domain is everything except negative four. Um, using the set minus notation, um, which I'll just add this here, and then you can kind of convert the others to set minus if you're interested, right? This would be the real numbers minus the set containing negative four, right? So, so it's everything but negative four. Okay, next, you know, maybe we can take a look at h of x is one over x squared plus four. The only candidate for this breaking would be if we're dividing by zero, which would mean that x squared plus four equals zero, but that would mean that x squared would have to be negative four, which since we're dealing with the real numbers, isn't possible, right? So the domain of, of H is the whole real number line, right? Any input in the real numbers is totally valid. Nothing breaks. Okay, let's say that, um, you know, let's pick another one. Let's say Q of X is the square root of X. Okay, well, this is a little bit different. Right? This is the sort of second archetype for how we'll get a problem in, in, in our domain. Remember that since we're working um, almost exclusively with the real numbers, right, the, the, the complex numbers will sort of come up again in a few weeks. Um, and until then, we can just assume that everything is, is all real numbers all the time. So if we have the square root of x, the, the square root of x is undefined for negative inputs, but it is defined on zero. So that means that our... Um, domain is all of the positive things and zero. Writing that in set notation, right, we're, we're going to have all of the, the x's where x is greater than or equal to zero. We can try this again, right? Let's, let's, let's go to another one, right? Let's say uh, z of x. Let's say the square root of 9 minus x squared. Okay. Um, so as we said before, right, the, the argument of our square root has to be greater than or equal to zero, right? Which tells me that nine minus x squared needs to be greater than or equal to zero, which then would tell me that um, x squared has to be less than or equal to nine. And we can't just take square roots here, right? Because we, we need to remember that negative numbers when squared become positive numbers. But this is equivalent to saying uh, that negative three is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to positive three. So this was our original restriction, right? That we sort of gained from the nature of, of the square root. And then we solve this inequality for x, we end up with this guy which means that our domain is just that, right? It, it's all of the x, where x is between negative three. And this is less than or equal to because the square root is defined on zero, right? The, the square root of zero is zero. I'm gonna make, let's not grab that. I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller so I can fit this last little section on this page. Let's, you know, do our, our, our final one here. Right, let's say um, m of t, right? Because we can kind of use whatever variable we want, right? Say that's t over the square root of one plus t, right? What is the domain of this expression? Well, we're looking for places where it's defined. And there's two potential issues here, right? We're, we're dividing by something and we're taking the square root. Right, so, so we need to look for places where both of these operations are defined. Well, our square root is defined when t is greater than or equal to one, right? If, if t is greater than or equal to one, then this is zero or some positive number. Okay, so as long as t is greater than or equal to one, this is defined. But what about our division? Our division is undefined when whatever's on the bottom is equal to zero. So that means that we actually lose equality here, right? If, if t is 
equal to negative 1, then we have 1 minus 1. We can totally take the square root of 0, but then we're dividing by 0. And, and that's bad, right? That breaks our situation. So then we're left with the set of all t, where t is strictly greater than negative 1, right? Again, because if t is, you know, less than, than negative 1, say, say negative 2, then our square root is undefined. If t is equal to negative 1, then our square root is defined, but we're dividing by 0, so we still get our function breaking.